Hello, AP Chemistry. Welcome to Acids and Bases. This is kind of exciting that we're turning this corner. Um, it tells me a couple things. First of all, we are really close to the end of our content. We really only have the application of acids and bases and then maybe a couple final, final topics and um, we're done with the class. So uh, welcome to that portion of, acid, of AP Chemistry. The other thing um, it tells me is that you guys have learned a lot. In order to be able to handle this content, this is kind of an application of a lot of what we talked about this year. It's a, it's the quintessential AP chemistry topic. If you look up any chemistry memes, you're sure to find them about acids and bases. If you ask anybody about their experience in chemistry, uh, they're probably going to talk about acids and bases. So welcome. You're here. Let's jump in, shall we? All right, so we have talked about acids and bases before in a very general term, way back at the beginning of the year. So we really want to get into the details of it now. So first of all, um, characteristics of acids and bases, anytime acids and bases are talked about, whether it's in middle school or high school chemistry or college chemistry, this is usually the first thing they talk about, how acids are sour, um, acids are caustic, um, bases tend to be bitter, bases tend to be slippery, also caustic. So uh, way back when, this is how acids and bases were defined. Um, anything that's slightly sour, probably going to be an acid. Anything that's bitter, slippery, makes a pretty good cleaning um, substance, it's probably going to be a base. Uh, now there's other things molecularly that we can use to identify acids and bases as well. And um, as chemists started looking at acids and bases and the reactions that they were in, they started building these definitions. So after the whole acids are sour, bases are bitter thing, came the first definition of acids and bases, which is the Arrhenius definition. So the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases um, is what we dealt with in the beginning of the year. So see if you can pause here and see if you can write out what is what are the definitions of acids and bases. We talked actually about two. We talked about the Arrhenius definition and we talked about the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Can you write those out? Okay, so the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases. So we're going to put, let's put acids on one side, bases on the other. Um, and this is, this was the very first definition that came out. Acids are H plus donors. A good example of that is HCl. When HCl is put into water, it donates an H plus and just ends up separating. Um, in the same way, bases were OH minus donors. A good example of that is NaOH. So we see when NaOH is put into water, it also separates and donates OH minus to the solution. So that's kind of the first definition of acids and bases. And then they realized that um, there are a couple things that can result in um, hydroxide building up in a solution that don't necessarily give off hydroxides. And so we come to our second definition. Um, acids are just the same. No surprises there. Um, bases, on the other hand, again, bases, bronsted lowry bases are anything that causes hydroxide to build up in solution, but doesn't necessarily do it by donating 
uh, a hydroxide. So a good example of this is ammonia. When ammonia reacts with water, let me show you what happens. So here's ammonia. Here is water. Okay, and what happens is ammonia attacks this hydrogen and it actually in some cases can pull the hydrogen off of the water. And so what you get is, I'm gonna run into my little camera here. Let me turn that off. Is something that looks like this. Uh, so notice we're going to have NH4 plus here, which is ammonia and OH minus. So ammonia pulls a hydrogen away from water and results in ammonium and hydroxide. And so ammonia is not a hydroxide donor but it's still, its presence still results in a buildup of hydroxide in the solution, which results in a basic solution, right? And so Bronside Lowry said, hold up, we have to expand this definition of bases a little bit to include H plus acceptors, which is what ammonia is. Ammonia is an H plus acceptor. And by accepting an H plus, from water, it results in a hydroxide ion being created and being built up in that solution. So we have two definitions of acids and bases now. Um, there's actually a third. I want to introduce you to this third definition of acids and bases, but we're not actually going to deal with it much until we get to the end of this chapter. So much of this chapter is going to be based on Arrhenius and Bronsted Lowry acids and bases. And then we will uh, look at including this third definition later. But let me tell you what it is for now. It is the Lewis definition. Again, we have a definition of an acid and a base. Okay, and so um, again, Lewis acids and bases kind of act a lot like Bronsted Lowry bases in that they result in, um, they can result in ions building up in, um, in a solution, which can lead to acidic or basic solutions, but they in and of themselves are not the donors of those ions. So. Um, actually, ammonia is a really good example of a Lewis base because ammonia, as we look at it, looks something like this, right? So we see here that ammonia has an electron-rich region, and that electron-rich region can attract positive things like the hydrogen that's attached to water, right? It attaches positive things. And this is the definition of a Lewis base is that it has an electron pair to donate, right? Electron pair donor. Um, so in this way, because it has this electron pair that it can donate or an electron pair that it has that can be involved in the reaction, it can end up, we can end up with a reaction like we just saw before where hydroxide gets built up in the solution. So uh, ammonia is a really good example because we just talked about it. You under already understand why it's a base. But there's a lot of different um, things that can act as electron pair donors. They just have uh, this like area of concentrated negative charge on them because they have extra electron pairs around them that can be used in a reaction. 
uh, a Lewis acid is kind of the flip side of that. A, a Lewis acid is the electron pair acceptor. Um, and this can be seen in a couple different ways. So first of all, hydrogen is a really good electron pair acceptor. So as we just saw, because hydrogen is kind of deficient in electrons, hydrogen is going to be attracted to region, regions that are full of electrons. Okay, hydrogen is a really obvious example, but there are other things that can act like this as well, like um, BF3 or BH3. I don't know if you guys remember talking about BH3 um, when we were talking about bonding, but if you look at the Lewis model of BH3, the best form of the Lewis model of BH3 is actually one in which the boron is electron deficient, right? It only has six electrons around it instead of the traditional eight electrons around it. It doesn't have an octet. It's stable without an octet. And if you look at the formal charges on this molecule versus alternatives, we saw that this is actually the best uh, model of the molecule that actually occurs. So as this is the, the molecule that actually occurs of boron trihydride, um, it's electron deficient. And so it's also going to be highly attracted to areas that are full of electrons. So boron trihydride could also possibly be a Lewis acid. Um, so again, like I said, the majority of this chapter, we're not going to deal with this Lewis definition of an acid and a base until we get to the end. Um, and so in the end, we're going to kind of fully circle back around, um, so that you can understand the whole spectrum of acids and bases, including these kind of weird acids and bases, um, that we have here. If you're going to recognize what a Lewis base is or a Lewis acid, if you want to recognize one of these, you must draw out the Lewis dot diagram. You really can't recognize if the molecule has an area that's electron deficient or the molecule has an area that's electron rich. You really can't recognize that until you draw the Lewis diagram. So if you are trying to decide if something is an acid or a base, and it has the potential to be a Lewis acid or a base, you must draw the Lewis structure to understand that. Okay, so now that we kind of have this overarching idea of what an acid and a base is, um, let's talk a little bit more specifically about um, some details of these. So, when we're dealing with acid and base reactions, acid and base reactions are notorious for hitting equilibrium. Some of them go to completion. A lot of them don't go to completion. If you're going to know which ones go to completion and which ones don't, you're going to have to use K. And as we saw in the last chapter, when we're dealing with K, we really have to do three things every single time. We have to write out a reaction. We have to write out the K equation and we have to evaluate an ice chart right? So when you're looking at acids and bases, it's really important to be able to write the equation of what happens to be able to write a balanced reaction of what happens with these things in water. So that's the first thing I want us to practice. Um, what is the general equation of acids and bases when you put them into water? Now we're going to talk about um, acids here first. And then after we kind of master acids, we'll come back and look at bases. Okay, so when you're looking at acids uh, like HCl, there's really two ways you can write this equation. What actually happens when an acid is put into water is the acid actually interacts with water. So the real equation is going to involve water. Let's look at these molecules here. 
Let me draw this in a different color. Okay, so we have HCL. I'm going to write it this way. And we have... Okay, so what happens when you have an acid into water is, first of all, when we have an acid, generally what we have is hydrogen attached to an anion, right? Now the anion is going to change. It could be chloride, could be fluoride, it could be nitrate, it could be phosphate. So that anion that's attached to the hydrogen may change and the changing anion actually changes the properties of the acid. So much of the properties that acids have are, are dependent on the anion that is part of the acid. In uh, this example, we have hydrogen attached to chloride, right? So let's think about what we know about chloride. We know chloride is a fairly small uh, atom. It has three energy levels. It has electrons in three energy levels. So it's not tiny, um, but it's also not super big. We also know that chloride has a lot of protons. Chloride has the most protons of any element in that has three energy levels outside of the noble gas. Lots of protons, not super big. That means that, that this anion is going to be very electronegative. Whenever you think about electronegativity, you should always think about Coulomb's law, where the force of attraction is going to be equal to the number of protons over the distance squared. So the more protons you have, the more electronegative it's going to be. The more distance you have, the less electronegative it's going to be, right? So chlorine is one of the elements on the periodic table that's the most electronegative, which means it's going to attract electrons very strongly to itself. It, it attracts electrons so strongly to itself that uh, it's one of the smallest atoms in its... Uh, in its family, in its row, because it attracts these electrons so strongly. That's going to include the electrons that it shares with hydrogen. That's going to include hydrogen's electron. And so chlorine is actually going to pull these electrons away from hydrogen. What you actually end up with is basically chlorine that has all the electrons right? And then you get this very small, uh, very naked in terms of electrons, hydrogen. You get this hydrogen that doesn't have much electrons around it. So it's very attracted to that chlorine because it has a very positive charge. It's also going to be attracted to anything that has a negative charge. So it's very attracted to its own chlorine, right? We know that. It's also very attracted to water. Notice water actually has extra electrons around it. It has two lone pairs of electrons. So oxygen, a very highly electronegative element, one of the top three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, also supporting two lone pairs of electrons so that hydrogen is going to be really attracted to that water. It's actually going to be more attracted to the water than it is to the chlorine. And so what happens is that water actually pulls the hydrogen off of the chlorine and you get this ion. What is this ion's name? This is the hydronium ion. So you get the hydronium ion and then you get chloride left by itself. Okay, so this is actually what happens when you put an acid into water. Let me erase some of this stuff down below and let's look at this real fast. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to give all of these things states. 
Okay, so HCl is going to be aqueous. H2O is going to be liquid. H3O is an aqueous ion, and chloride is also an aqueous ion. Okay, so now that we have a reaction, we can write a K equation. So we write H3O plus on the top, Cl minus, <clears throat> HCl on the bottom. <clears throat> Notice water gets left out of this because water is a liquid and we don't include liquids and solids into our K equation, right? The concentration of something pure is one and so it just gets multiplied out of our K equation. Okay, now we could write the reaction of any acid just like this. So notice that we could write a general equation. We have our acid, which is a hydrogen attached to an anion. It reacts with water, okay? And it produces the hydronium ion and the anion all by itself. So our K equation, we can also write as a generalized K equation. A minus would go on the top, HA would go on the bottom. Okay, now, if you understand something from today, this is what I want you to understand, okay? So if this next part confuses you, you can just ignore that I said this next part. However, this is a lot to write, right? And as chemists, we want to be as efficient as possible. And so we tend to scale things down when we can. Since water is left out of the K equation, a lot of times we don't actually write out the equation like I have written it out above. We actually will drop water from the equation. And what you end up writing is a dissociation reaction, right? Something like that. Now look at this. If I write the K, I end up with the exact same K. Oh, I made it general in one place and not general in the other here. I can do a CL minus. <clears throat> Notice I end up with the exact same K. I'm going to end up with the exact same ice chart since we're not going to track water through our ice chart anyway. Um, notice we are pretending that the hydronium ion is H+, but when you make that assumption that the hydronium ion is actually H+, everything else works out the same. So uh, we may get to the point where we just write acids in a very efficient way, write the, out the reaction, write out the K, write out the ice chart in an efficient way, even though it's not the actual way. What actually happens when an acid is put into water, this stuff at the top actually happens. What's more efficient? Well, this way at the bottom is more efficient. So all this to say you're gonna see both ways written okay so um you're, you're going to have to kind of embrace this idea of that of the efficiency direction not necessarily being what actually happens okay so <laughs> with all of that said let's go back to what we have written above. Okay, so whenever an acid or a base either reacts in water or reacts with another substance, what you have, something important to notice that you have in the reaction is a conjugate. So a conjugate is kind of the other half if my acid is hydrogen attached to my anion, my conjugate is the anion. Okay, so in both acids and bases, when you take away the ion that causes it to be an acid or a base, in the case of acids, that ion would be the hydrogen ion. In the case of a base, that ion would be the hydroxide ion. When you take away 
the hydrogen and the hydroxide, what you have left is called a conjugate. And notice the conjugate always shows up in the reaction. We have the conjugate right here in our reaction above. It shows up in the reaction. It shows up in the K equation. Um, and the, the conjugate is actually going to be really important as we start looking at these reactions and also as we start looking at the strength of acids and bases. Um, so being able to identify acid, acid conjugates or base conjugates is an important skill and uh, we're going to use this in the next couple slides coming up. So hang on to that term conjugate. It's going to be the ion. Oh, that shouldn't be A plus. That should be A minus. Okay, and then you might also hear this term acid dissociation constant. So remember when we were dealing with equilibrium and we talked about the law of mass action, we had the equilibrium constant K. We had the reaction quotient. Q. Well, now we have the acid dissociation constant. And what the acid dissociation constant is, is K for an acidic reaction. So what you're going to see is K subscript A. That little subscript A tells you it's the dissociation constant for an acid in an aqueous solution. So again, uh, notice here it's it's a dissociation constant, right? So auto automatically we're treating this as if the acid is dissociating instead of really reacting with water, which you know it's not. You know the actual thing that acids are doing is reacting with water. Um, but a lot of times we write it as if the acid is just dissociating. And that's the K that comes out of it. So this K that we wrote above, that's the acid dissociation constant. Now, sometimes what you'll see is they'll give you a Ka. They'll say like the Ka for HC2H3O2 is blah, 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 right? What, what are the equilibrium positions of all the ions? They'll ask you something like that. Well, that means you have to write an equation. You have to write a balanced reaction. You have to write a K equation. Um, and you have to write an ice chart just from this information that they just gave you, right? So what they're saying is <clears throat> they're telling you what reaction happened just by giving you the specific K with the subscript. They're telling you it's acid dissociation. It's an acid that's being put into water. And so from that information only, we should be able to write a reaction, right? So acetic acid, HC2H3O2, reacts with water to form the hydronium ion plus, oops, I ran out of space. C2H3O2 minus or acetate, right? Um, sometimes when they give you a problem like this, the acid is so large and complicated, or maybe it's a protein and it's giant. Instead of writing the whole thing out, you can just write HA and understand that A is your anion, reacts with water, to form hydronium plus A minus. Okay, so sometimes, especially when the acid is super bulky, I don't waste my time by writing out the super bulky acid. I'll just skip that part and use the general equation for an acid. And I know that A is going to be my anion no matter what that anion is. So it's, that's a way to save yourself some time. Okay, so here we are. Uh, after all of that, we've talked through a lot of um, facts about acids. So let's practice a little bit here. Actually, I just did the top two for you. So um, we're going to come back 
when we are live together, we're going to come back and we're going to try these things. Try writing out the equation, try writing out the K and make sure we can do that. Um, I'll substitute A and B for you since I just used those two, two examples on the other page so that you can have a chance practicing this with different types of acids. And then we'll try this multiple choice. Okay, acid strength. All right, so one of the big uh, ideas that comes out of this chapter is acid strength. And like I talked about on the last page, the anion that your hydrogen is attached to is going to determine a lot of properties about your acids. And one of the properties, one of the major properties we want to look at when we're talking about acids is strength. So first of all, when we put an acid into water, right? Let's go back to HCl. When we put an acid into water, that uh, acid is going to be pulled apart by water and it's going to result in the hydronium ion and the anion floating around, right? Remember, it's actually the hydronium ion because it's actually reacting with water. See, already I'm into abbreviations. Okay, now the anion that is attached to your hydrogen makes all the difference in the world as to where this equilibrium is going to lie. So when we're talking equilibrium, remember we're talking about how many of your acid molecules are actually going to be pulled apart and end up as ions. Is just one of these going to be pulled apart and end up as ions? Okay, that dissociation, that equilibrium, we would say lies far left because we have lots of our reactant left and we don't have very many of our products or our ions, right? Not very much of our acid has dissociated or has reacted with water. However, if we get most of these, most of this original acid falls apart um, or gets pulled apart by water and ends up as ions floating around in that in that water, then uh, we would say that the equilibrium lies far left, right? We got lots of products. Almost all of all of what's left is floating around as ions. We don't have very many reactants left. So in the first case where we just had one molecule fall apart, the K would be small. In the second case, where we get most of our acid falling apart, the K would be big. So when we're talking about acid strength, what we do is we look at the K. If the K is large for our acid, what that means is that most of our acid tends to fall apart. We don't have much of our molecular acid left it's all fall, it has all been pulled apart into ions floating around, right? So these would be our strong acids. They're all going to have really big Ks. And in fact, the K is so big. Remember, our K equation is going to look like this. The K is so large, we have so little of our original acid molecule left. We have almost no original acid molecule left in solution. It's so small that it's not accurately measured anymore. And so for something like HCl, which is a very strong acid, when you look up the K of HCl in a chart of acid dissociation constants, what you're going to see is the word large. You're not even going to see a number because they can't accurately determine that ending concentration of our original acid. It's too small to be measured consistently. So instead of communicating it as a number, they just write the term large. That's how big it is. That's how much actually gets dissociated. So this happens with anything 
that we deem strong, or I should probably say for anything that is a strong acid, this actually occurs. The K is going to be listed as large instead of a number. Now, uh, if we say K is large, basically if it's over one, we consider it to be a large K and we consider it to be a strong acid. But instead of having to look this up every time, there's actually a list. And you memorize this list way back at the beginning of the year, right? So we have to re remember this list. Um, for whatever is a strong acid, you should have that thing memorized and automatically know that the K is gonna be large. So what are our strong acids? This would be a good time to pause the video, see if you can name them. So it's all of our ha halohydrides, right? It's all of our halogens, halogen ions that get turned into acids, except for HF. HF is a weak acid. It's also HNO3, H2SO4, HClO4, HClO3. Okay, so those are all going to be strong acids with very large Ks. You need to have that list memorized. You need to be able to tell me off the top of your head that these are all strong acids. Anything else you come across is going to be a weak acid. Any other thing that you um, determine is going to be acidic is going to be a weak acid. So that's an automatic division that we can make without having to reference any chart, right? Okay, so when we know that something is a strong acid or a strong base, something we already know is the strength of its conjugate. Okay, so let's go back to HCl in this reaction that you're going to be able to recite in your sleep in just a couple of days. Okay, so we have a strong acid here. In fact, we're gonna call this a very strong acid. Your book only makes two distinguishing categories. They say strong and weak, but I wanna make a couple other categories to help you understand some of the concepts behind here. So we're going to rank acids based on their strength in the very, strong acid category. Those would be our seven that we just listed, HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, and then the perchlorate and the chlorate acids, okay? Then we're gonna have strong and weak. And then we're gonna have very weak, AKA useless. I know it seems like a harsh term, but it's the best description out there. Useless acids, right? Okay, so let me explain why we need all of these categories. Because if we have something that's very strong, it's conjugate, we can already rank in terms of strength, again, without even looking them up. So HCl is very strong. We talked about this before, right? That, uh, that chlorine takes the electron so strongly, it basically leaves H plus out there all by itself with no electrons around it. Therefore, H plus is very attracted to anything that has electrons, including the extra electrons that are on water, right? We talked about this. Okay, and so hydrogen tends to go that direction so strongly that it forms this hydronium ion, very strongly leaves chlorine by itself, right? So chlorine is the conjugate, right? HCl is the acid, Clo the chloride ion is the conjugate to hydrochloric acid. So this uh, conjugate is now a base. Look at if the chloride ion could pull something off of water, what is it going to pull off? Well, it's going to reverse this reaction. It's going to pull off, actually, 
I shouldn't say H2O, I should say H3O. It's going to pull that hydrogen back off of water to form the opposite reaction, H2O plus HCl, right? So the conjugate is going to fight for the reverse of the reaction. The acid is going to fight for the forward reaction. So basically, we have what's going on down here. Here is our reverse and forward reaction all together. Now, the strength of the acid depends on which one wins, right? If water wins always, then HCl is going to be pulled apart all the time and end up as ions floating around. If chlorine wins always, it's going to be very strong and push, push in the other direction, but they can't both win always. So with anything that's strong, like HCl or the other six strong acids, water wins always. Water always pulls it apart pulls it apart completely, pulls it apart so much that we can't even accurately measure how much HCl is left in solution, leaving us with, an, with a large K, right? Which means Cl minus is never successful. Cl minus cannot pull a hydrogen off of hydronium. So if HCl is very strong, its conjugate is very weak right? Okay, so this is always true. If your acid is very strong, its conjugate is going to be useless. Cl minus wants to pull hydrogens away from hydronium. It's acting as a base. Cl minus wants to be a hydrogen acceptor. That's the definition of a base right? But it can't do that with hydronium. It's never successful. And so it is a useless base. Very strong acids have conjugates that are useless bases. Now we have this category in the middle that we haven't talked about yet, but this would be the case of acetic acid. So HC2H3O2 is undergoing this same battle, right? C2H3O2 minus is attracted to the H plus. That H plus is also attracted to water. And if water wins, then a forward reaction happens where we form H3O plus and acetate, C2H3O2 minus. If acetate wins, we have the opposite that's going on here, right? So acetic acid is our acid. Acetate is our base in this case. Acetic acid is the acid. Acetate is its conjugate base. So acetate is a weak acid. It's about for out of a thousand molecules, about one will be pulled apart by water. So if acetate is considered a weak acid, H2, not H2, H, C2H3O2, its conjugate is successful most of the time, right? 999 times out of a thousand, acetate wins, pulls that hydrogen back away from hydronium, or water also, right? And pushes the reaction in the opposite direction. So if acetate is a weak base or weak acid, then it's conjugate, sorry. If acetic acid is the weak acid, it's conjugate, C2H3O2 minus is a strong base. So this is why we want to make a designation, a difference between strong and very strong, right? Acetate does not have a large K. Acetate does not pull apart water always, right? Like a strong acid or a strong base would do, okay? Acetate, the ion, is not in that very strong category, but it is stronger than its conjugate acid, which is acetic acid. 
So a couple takeaways from this, and then we will work with this together. I know it's a lot of definitions. Okay. I know that we're going to work with this until it makes sense. So a couple takeaways. First of all, if you have an acid, it's conjugate is a base. If you have a base, it's conjugate is an acid. Now, if you have an acid, you can, and you know the strength of that acid, you can know about the strength of its conjugate, right? So if you have a very strong acid, its conjugate is a very weak base. That's also true for bases. If you have a very strong base, its conjugate is a very weak acid or a useless acid. If you have a weak acid, its conjugate is a stronger base, right? Same thing with bases. If you have a weak base, its conjugate is a stronger acid. So by knowing the conjugates, by being able to recognize them inside the formula, and by knowing the strength of one, we can already categorize the strength of the other. Okay, so mull on that, think about that, try to reorganize and categorize that. Let me know what questions you have. We will practice this together until it makes sense. Come to me with your questions. I will see you in class.